for uh, for Onus's Fulci thing. Pardon? <laughs> oh. His Fulci documentary. Yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, Lucio Fulci. I was did you have any sort of um, window into what this guy was like? Or I never met him. Mm -hmm. Never met him. I don't know anything uh, except he was a character. I do know that from all those who, who spoke, who, um, who, who worked with him, but I was never in a, in a film of his as an actor. And I do know that he just didn't give a hell about the English version. He did not care. He says, that has nothing to do with me. Mine is the Italian version. I don't care what you do with it. Uh, dub it into Japanese or whatever you want. Not interested. You're, I'm not the one making money off the English version. So that, that I do know. That was, that's a quote I heard from him from about the, from about, uh, uh, for about the dubbing of his films. And I do know that he was a character. I, he was fun on screen. He was fun on screen because he took he usually took a part in his films, and uh, I always put Bob Spafford on him, and Bob enjoyed doing him. Um, but that is the extent of my knowledge of Lucio Fulci. Um, the last films I did with Bruno Mattei, I did a bunch of films of his. He was a, a sweet old guy. And maybe the only human being on earth who smokes more than I do. <laughs> and, but uh, there were, he, had, he didn't have a lot to say. He said, okay, yeah, this will do. Maybe we can try. The, I mean, he didn't come to the dubbing sessions, but he was at the mix of the English version. And um, once again, I never took part in any of his films as an actor. Uh, I was going to at one point, and I don't know what happened, some scheduling difficulties or something happened. I don't know, God, when, when, that we must be talking about eight, nine years ago. I don't know if, I hope he's still with us, but he was an, he's an elderly, he was an elderly gentleman at the time. He, he's gone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I've always wondered watching his movies, like, because they're, I mean, they're, they usually take an American movie and they just, like, copy it. Yeah, yeah, much. yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the time I couldn't tell if it was like meant to be funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it was ever meant to be funny. I don't think so. <laughs> no, okay. yeah. I don't think so. I think there was uh, serious cinema. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I mean, uh, politically uh, in the seventies, Italy was going through like, like a <laughs> red brigade. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. There, yeah. there was a lot of terrorism and ma mafia. Yeah. And, uh, did any of that ever affect you? It didn't way? affect me, but it, it affected a dear friend of mine. I don't know if you have run across her name, Lucretia Love, who I've just started re-corresponding with after 35 years. Um, Tim put us back in contact. And she and her husband, Mauro, uh, had made several films and were doing very well. And they, one of their films was opening in 69, and there was a big bomb blast next door from the Red Brigades. And that, and that ended their filmmaking. She stuck around for a couple of more years. I used to, used to use her in the dubbing all the time, and then she decided to take off. And then I found out, because they're making a, there's a French guy named Gère, was doing her life story and would like to do a documentary about it, and I think it would be fascinating. He sent me the synopsis, and she's doing wonderful, wonderful things in the Seychelles, teaching art to children and things like that. And um, I don't think it had a profound effect on the cinema. It, it, because it, because the cinema, the seventies was mostly the um, zero zero seven. Ripoffs, well, yeah, and yeah. and it, and they went on and on and on. The seventies was a, was a very very fruitful time, so I don't think the Red Brigades had that much of a a great effect on cinema in general. It did on my friend Lucretia, unfortunately, but uh, well, like the mafia movies, was it uh, did it have um, was there ever like were the makers like intimidated by the actual mafia or inspired? Not that I ever heard. Not that I ever heard. And uh, I probably would have, at least through Luciano, who, who's still a friend today, 50 years later. And um, no, I don't, I don't recall any, any of that ever happening. I think it was too fictionalized 
for the real mafia to be worried about. Um, you know, like, I guess Poor said he lived in kind of an American neighborhood in Rome, like, with, like, a lot of expatriates, like, while he was there. Um, <coughs> like, was it kind of, I mean, did you really interact with the American, like, say, when Arthur Kennedy or Joseph Cotton or one of these you guys would go over to Italy, I mean, would, would they typically, like, interact with them? Well, if, it depends. If we worked with them, yes. Mm -hmm. for, for instance, my, the guy I mentioned, Mike Billingsley, the synchronizer, was a, turned out to be a great friend of the detective in Psycho, Marty Balsam. Mm -hmm. Marty Balsam. Mm -hmm. And he had him over a lot. And we lived about 100 yards away from each other, so we mingled a lot. So we knew Marty Balsam through them. Uh, we, through friends of ours, got to know Gore Vidal very well, and he was often over. And common courtesy, we invited Mike and Rhoda over, so they got to know them. So if, um, and then I worked at Bob Spafford, have I got this right? Yeah, worked with Ann Jackson's husband, um, Eli Wallach. We all had dinner several times when he was in town dubbing himself in a, in a thing. So if there was a personal reaction, yes. Um, about 30 years, I was just discussing this last night at dinner, there was Tony Musante, who did a ton of films in Italy. And one day he appeared in my studio to dub himself in a film he had done there. And we have, be, we have been very, very close friends ever since, ever since. Uh, and uh, they were, I saw them, uh, every time I have a, a, a chance, when I was here in LA in January, they were here for the, um, for whatever reason they were here. We got together twice, and then I got to, I've seen them three times this year, which is amazing. They used to come to Italy much more often because he did many more films, but since there are no films, but we have remained close for, for certainly 30 years, certainly 30 years. And uh, <coughs> another dear friend who did a lot of westerns in Italy under the name of Hunt Powers, and is now, when we came back here to, to L.A., and his, his name and his, went back to his real name, which is Jack Betts, and he's another very, very dear, dear, dear friend of mine, and who's not supposed to know I'm <laughs> like Mike. And, um, but other than that, you, if we had no contact with them, I mean, I, I never, I never, had any contact with Joe Cotton at all. Um, Carolyn worked as um, the sync director for Sergio Leone on I, one or several of his films. And some of, some of them you, oh, we had a great time with George. He was in The Owl and the Pussycat with Barbara Streisand. George, 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 funny guy, lovely guy, and then he disappeared. Okay. Well, you, it, it'll come to it'll come to you at some point, um, uh, but uh, and oh, and Carolyn knew. Uh, here, here we go again. Uh, this is another name I can't come up with. We saw him several times, but uh, Jason Robards. She worked with him, got along with him very nicely. There was no hint of socialization. You, no one, she, no one said let's go out to dinner. So that never happened. Henry Fonda. She loved him. Sweet. The, no, let's go out to dinner. So, you know, it either happened or it didn't. And, and uh, it was uh, instantaneous between the, the Musantes and us, instantaneous with Jack Betts and us, and has remained even longer. Jack Betts was here like 40, was there like 40 years ago. Tony, I think, from 30 years. And as I say, if it works, it works. We had, we had one wonderful evening at our house where everyone was there, uh, Eli and Anne, and Marty Balsam, and Gore Vidal, and it was a, a, a really terrific, fun, fun evening. And but, of course, Gore lived in Rome for many, many years, so we saw quite a bit of him. The others were just visitors, but, but uh, we saw um, Marty Balsam several times. He came over several times, but the Eli just the one time. 
Mm-hmm. Lee Van Cleef, ever... I came here to direct him in one of his voiceovers. I think it was a, a Sabato movie, but that's what John Charles says. I don't remember what it was, but it was uh, a good 20 years ago. And I enjoyed his company very much, and he was a funny, quirky guy. And it was a condition in his contract that there in the studio there be a six-pack of St. Pauli Girl beer. And he came in, he said, we introduced ourselves, and I said, he said, nice to meet you. Is my beer here? I said, I'm sorry, I really don't. He says, you know, I won't work with it. He's like, oh, there, okay. Let's put up the first loop. Funny, funny guy and with a, a wicked sense of humor, and I really enjoyed meeting him. But once again, no, let's have lunch or a drink, nothing. So I, I, I really enjoyed that day I spent with him, very, very much so. Um, Carolyn and uh, I once came here, as I told you, to, to d- do, um, who's the guy you were talking about? Van Cleef? No, 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 the one with the big cheekbones. <laughs> you know who I mean. Um, Henry Silva? Huh? Henry Silva? Henry Silva, right. Uh, there was not much interaction there, not much interaction there. Um, when John Saxon, I came over here to do John Saxon, and he went to Rome once to do John Saxon. And when he found out that I was married to his ex-girlfriend, we all got together several times and had a great, great time. Just the, the, the three of us. And that was fine, and that was, that was terrific. And uh, I've, um, every time I go to London, uh, if he's there, I get together with Bob Hoskins. And... Um, just a super, super, super guy. And I would love to have another chance to see, to meet Max. Oh, I'm, I, know, I did a film with Maximilian Schell, who was very standoffish. So nothing much happened there. But, but it was a good, it was called The Eighteenth Angel. And it wasn't much of a film, except it was one of the longer parts that I have had. I generally do five, six, seven days work on a film. That's sort of the norm. But I had like 15 on this, so I had a, it was a good part. Um, how about like a, like a double team with uh, Dennis Rodman and Jean-Claude Van Damme? Yeah, that was fun. I, my, 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 the image I carry from that one is driving an old open um, Volkswagen convertible with Dennis Rodman's stunt double sitting next to me on four suitcases so that he would appear as tall as Dennis Rodman. (laughs) This is the image. That was great fun. I had fun with uh, Van Damme. He was nice. We spoke French together. Um, uh, I enjoyed I've I've enjoyed I've enjoyed every film I've done Mm -hmm. and uh, I enjoy the non-biblical ones more, but there have been very few of them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one of my, my teachers in film school, I guess, directed you in uh, The Curse for the Catacombs. Oh, uh, Schmoller. Schm- David Schmoller. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, what was, what was he like? Or, uh, I, I, well, that was, well, I, just had two, I just had two days on that, but it was fine. He, he was, uh, I did my own stunt work, of course, I was young enough to do that, and he was very impressed by that. I had to fall backwards into a pit. I said, I'll do it. And, and no great harm. I got very, very dirty indeed. Mm-hmm. But uh, he, he, was, he was appreciative of that, because among other things, there wasn't a stunt ban on the set that day. <laughs> so I said, what the hell? I would be, we're talking a long time ago. Yeah, wow. 88, 87? Yeah, something like that. That was a Charles Band uh, production? Yeah, right, yeah. Albert Band. Oh, Al- right. Albert, Char- well, one, well, one was a son and, was it father and son? Or, or, or they were brothers? Albert was the father, Charles was the son. Right, yeah. Oh. That was out, out at the De Laurentiis Studios. Oh, okay. Yeah, or what used to be called the De Laurentiis Studios. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my roommate was just in a Charles Band movie huh. like, uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. Was it, he, is he here in Rome? Oh, I'm here in Rome. Is he here in L.A.? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the, the Valley. Like San Gabriel Valley. Yeah. Um, okay, well, cool. Um, 
is there kind of like any last thought about like just the whole experience of like the whole like what how would you just describe the whole like your I mean it's ongoing but yeah uh, well I just I wouldn't trade it with anyone else's life I could think of I've had more fun I've gotten to exercise the talents that I'm good at I'm still sorry I never made it as an opera singer and uh, but I haven't given up hope. <laughs> I've had a great time. I've had a great, great life. And um, I have wonderful children. And what more can I say? I, I, I've worked with some wonderful actors. I've been very privileged. And um, I've worked with some, some crappy ones. And I've had lots of fun, even with the crappy actors. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Ted. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Guess what I'm going to do? Oh. I'm going to have a smoke and turn on my... Oh, do you want this? <laughs>